Uh, we think as we get closer to uh, 2030, we think the price of this kind of stuff is going to come down, especially as now people are looking into sustainable fuels and hydrogen power and the technology is now developing. So there's a lot of big investment in the technology which will bring the price down. And as the price comes down, I don't think it's ever going to be affordable for everybody. Um, but at the moment, the orbital experience are reserved for the real high net worth people. Anyone old enough to remember Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walking on the surface of the moon in 1969 could well have dreamt of a future where space travel was as commonplace as booking a transatlantic flight or a safari in Kenya. But half a century or so since that first lunar landing aboard Apollo 11, that's exactly how it remained, a dream. However, a new generation of space pioneers, from Jeff Bezos to Richard Branson, have reignited our hopes that orbital and suborbital spaceflight and even lunar landings may soon become a regular part of the travel landscape for those of us who aren't lucky enough to work for NASA. Will the opportunities for space travel really trickle down to the everyday tourist or will they remain the preserve of the ultra wealthy? How do operators of commercial space travel ensure safety so far from Earth and when, if ever, will we see the first ever tourist walking on the surface of the moon? My name's Jack, and you're listening to Battleface Uncharted, a podcast brought to you by Battleface Travel Insurance. We speak to some of the travel industry's leading figures to discover the trends that you need to know about. Of course, if you're an aspiring space tourist, you need to start somewhere. And where better than the world's first space travel agency, Rocket Breaks, founded by David Doughty and Barry Shanks. David and Barry have their backgrounds in the private aviation industry, with David being the managing director of the private jet company, Admiral Jet. During the lockdowns of 2020, the pair got talking about ways of diversifying their business interests and hit upon space travel after realising their skills and knowledge base were surprisingly transferable. After securing agreements with some of the world's most established suppliers of space tourism, Rocket Breaks was able to offer a range of experiences from astronaut training days and zero-g flights aboard a modified Boeing 727, all the way up to orbital and suborbital space travel, and even a 10-day stay aboard the International Space Station. Of course, this is a subject very close to the heart of Battleface, since we became the first insurance company to offer custom space travel insurance, underwritten by certain underwriters at Lloyd's. If you're an individual, an insurance broker, or a space flight company, follow the link in the video's description to find out more about that product. So, David, how rich do I have to be to sign up for one of your premium space experiences? And what would that actually entail? So, yeah, I mean, to be honest, it isn't cheap. So, um, for example, the, the orbital travel um, pretty much starts at about £20 million. Um, that entails maybe a, a stay on the International Space Station or a circumlunar mission where um, you go around the moon. Um, I mean, the choices are endless, really. Um, but it's it's not a holiday, so you have to get involved in some of the experiments. You have to get involved in the day-to-day -day, um, running of the actual uh, spacecraft. Um, you have to do all of the training, so you have to you, you have to prepare to be training like an astronaut and do the full astronaut training in order to do an orbital mission. Got you. So, what about those of us whose pockets aren't quite as deep? Does this confine us to uh, to Earth? We do. I mean, that's where we come in, really. We try and find the right experience for the budget and also the right experience for what the person's looking for. So we do everything from, um, obviously, as we mentioned, a um, orbital or a suborbital, which is kind of your virgin galactic, kind of go up to the curvature of the Earth and come back down type experience. But we also offer things like um, a zero G experience, which basically um, you go on a, an adapted Boeing aircraft 
and it does certain manoeuvres in order for you to experience certain levels of weightlessness up until sometimes we can even do a children's party where we can um, have an astronaut experience so people can try on a replica Tim Peak spacesuit. They can have the, um, the, the food um, that maybe you'd eat in space so you can get somebody to get some kind of the, the space food that they would eat on, on um, uh, a um, space rocket and even hold things, pieces like moon rock and stuff like that. So it's the whole, it's really is the whole spectrum from the, the premium orbital experience, which is the big headline grabber, to even walking around a space research facility. A space travel agency still sounds like it's straight out of science fiction. Do you sometimes have to pinch yourself that this is the field you're specialising in? Um, yes and no, really. I mean, it feels quite natural for us. So um, our um, one of our businesses is, is a uh, private jet company. So, again, it's we, we offer a really high-end experience and we're used to dealing with high net worth people who are quite demanding. So for us, it felt a natural kind of bolt on to what we already do because the procedures we do on terms of arranging a private jet would be almost exactly the same for somebody after a space experience. It's just the destination that's different. Got you. There, there must be many more sort of safety concerns or, or are these kind of similar to, um, you know, private um, aviation? There are safety concerns, um, but it's it's a new thing to do. So we always argue that there is going to be a risk, um, but there was a risk when the first aeroplane took off or the first cruise ship took off or someone invented a pair of skis. That, uh, with anything that's new to the marketplace and anything that's co constantly developing, there's always going to be a risk. What are some of the ways that operators mitigate those risks? You know, not only say on on the launch for a, a suborbital or orbital um, flight, um, but also the, the difficulties of just look, looking after tourists so far from Earth, so far from you know hospitals and that sort of immediate emergency medical treatment that they could receive. Yeah, so on the orbital stuff, they obviously have fully trained. They're all fully medically trained, so they're able to perform even minor operations um, at the space. On terms of the smaller stuff, so like the orbital and the suborbital, it's kind of no different on being on an aircraft, really, because you're so close to being back to Earth that if there was an emergency, you could effectively abort and come back down almost immediately. What about then the, the physical fitness of these um, of these tourists, if we can call them that? There must be you know, physical requirements in order to actually take part in these missions. It depends on which which experience they go for. So um, the orbital experience will will be full on 100% space training. Um, your suborbital, I mean, little to no training. I mean, recently, um, William Shatner's gone suborbital and I think he's nearly 90, I think, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you, there has to be a certain level of... Um, physicalness to it but that's more down to the individual rather than kind of the health wise of course if you've got a heart condition or you've got mega high blood pressure or whatever it's not going to be recommended but if you're in a, a general average fitness all of the experiences apart from probably the orbital one um would be fine you mentioned uh, William Shatner there, and you know I'm sure many of us kind of you know watched this on TV, the the flight with uh, Blue Origin, I think it was. Um, you know, do, do you, as more operators join the field, do you anticipate this type of space travel experience becoming a much more mainstream proposition in coming years? Absolutely, and I mean the the good thing about it is is there's actually. Um... So, so not all of the experiences are the same, particularly if you look at the suborbital experiences. So some of them, for example, are high-end, fast, adrenaline fueled missions. Others, there's companies out there that offer um, basically, in, I'll, I'll make it a bit more simple, but it's effectively a capsule um, attached to a hot air balloon. And that goes up to the curvature of the earth. They have music, they have champagne, they have canapes. 
and it's a lot more gentle. So there's an experience for every type of personality or whatever. Our, our job is to find out what somebody wants from the experience and then to match them to the right one. So then it's not all blue origin, fast adrenaline fuel, get to space, come back straight down. There's lots of things from that to the Gentile version to everything in between, really. Your website says that there's fewer than 800 people have ever visited um, the ISS uh, and only 24 have ever left Earth's orbit and, and journeyed close to the moon. How would you expect those numbers to, to grow in coming years? Do you, do you have any insight into um, you know how, how much that could expand? Yeah, I mean, we think uh, we think as we get closer to uh, 2030, we think the price of this kind of stuff is going to come down, especially as now people are looking into sustainable fuels and hydrogen power and the technology is now developing. So there's a lot of big investment in the technology, which will bring the price down. And as the price comes down, I don't think it's ever going to be affordable for everybody. Um, but at the moment, the orbital experience are reserved for the real high net worth people. Um, but as it comes down, I think you'll get the, it's still going to be for the high earners, if I'm honest, but you'll get the type of people that would take a private jet, be able to afford um, some orbital space shuttle. Or, or maybe it will, it will become the sort of equivalent of, you know, booking a, a family for five on safaris, a, you know, a fairly pricey holiday and, you know, may, you know, kind of having the choice between that and a suborbital flight. Absolutely. Or say Concord. We're, back in the day with Concord, it was that type of thing. People would, you could get a British Airways standard flight to the US or you could get a Concord to the US for three or four times the cost. Um, so, yeah, it's that type of thing, really. We've seen the rise of these private um, space travel companies and uh, also plans for the world's first space hotel. What other opportunities do you think are available within the, the burgeoning space tourism industry? There's lots. So we went to um, Space Expo um, at Farnborough um, back in September. And there's so much research and so much being invested within the sector. There's also companies that want to be part of the sector. And you know what? They don't really know what they're going to do yet. Um, and I won't name them, but there's some real big companies that you would have heard of that are kind of saying to us, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and we want to be involved in this industry. We just don't quite know what we're going to do yet. Um, but there's all sorts of companies out there from kind of technology and artificial intelligence and the use of like droids and stuff like that to companies that are looking... We spoke to one company in particular who were saying, look, they're going to build all of these space hotels. We need to develop a way of getting the building materials into space. So that's some, there's a company there whose whole business plan is if there's building space hotels and there's going to be tourism in space, then our company is effectively going to be the removal man who takes all your materials up into space for you so you can build these hotels. Got you. You, you've talked um, about how, you know, you, you obviously went from um, you know, private aviation, uh, you know, into this this new industry. What what were some of the, the skills or the knowledge base that was transferable between the two related industries? It's the, some of it is the experience in dealing with high net worth individuals. Um, some of it is the processes. So with private aviation, you don't, or we don't as a company offer the cheapest option to go from A to B, we offer the right option. So we'll give them a selection of options and we'll listen to what the client wants. And we will then give them a selection of options based on their requirements rather than based on the price. So we feel that that was a really transferable skill because if somebody's coming to us for a space experience, it's about, for them, it's going to be a once in a lifetime experience or to start with, certainly. So it's about listening to their requirements and actually matching the right experience to their requirements, similar to probably a safari. So if you was going on a safari, really, it's not the type of thing you would book direct. You would go to a safari specialist and you would say to them, I want to see the elephants. I want to see the tigers. I want to see whatever. 
and they would if they were doing their job right they would match you to the right national park or the right area or the right um whatever they're doing for that individual's requirements and that's that, basically that's the skill that's transferable it's it's the getting beyond just looking at the price and actually creating the experience but we can also then offer the ongoing travel so some of these some of these space experiences are in the US um, and we can do everything from not just the experience, but getting getting the passengers to the US, the party afterwards. So we do a thing where we give what they call a hero's party. So all of their friends and family can come along and they can celebrate the momentous occasion. And I mean, who wouldn't want to be? I mean, when Richard Branson went to went up in um, Virgin Galactic, I mean, he was astronaut 001. I mean, does it get any better than that? Maybe astronaut 007, probably. But <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. Who doesn't want to be astronaut 001? Sure. How how far do you think we're away from the first uh, tourist walking on the moon, David? Uh, I reckon we've been. I mean. <laughs> It's, it's quite far in terms of if you think years, to be honest, but if you think in terms of technological feet, it's probably just around the corner. I reckon within the next 10 to 15 years, that would happen. Oh, wow. And and to get a little bit more speculative, uh, with, with current technology, a trip to Mars would take as long as seven months. Does, does that write off the planet as a tourist destination within our lifetimes? I mean, it does at the moment. Uh, the, the trouble you've got with that is your high net worth individuals and stuff like that. They're generally busy people. Um, and they're not the type of people that can just take seven months out of the diary. In order, I mean, don't get me wrong, it'd be an amazing mission. But until that time, until the, the distance to get them, the distance to get back is shortened, I just don't think it's viable, to be honest. Final question then. Elon Musk has, has expressed his desire to be aboard that first space flight to Mars. Would you sign up if offered the chance? Um, I wouldn't actually. And the only reason being is I am really claustrophobic. So um <laughs> uh, it it wouldn't be it wouldn't be for me, but I know Barry, who's my business partner, would absolutely jump at the chance and would would love every second of it. Um for me, the second the doors are shut, I'd be screaming to get off. You've been listening to Battleface Uncharted. <laughs>